a room so bright Talking science under starry skies Artificial minds of space inside Deep dive podcast taking flight Cosmos mysteries they unfold Machines with wisdom stories told Future secrets brave and bold Deep dive making hearts behold Deep dive, deep dive into the unknown Sight stars and minds have grown Deep dive, deep dive voices so clear Journey with us far and near Unknown Science stars and minds have grown Deep dive, deep dive, voices so clear Journey with us far and near You know, it's kind of wild how even now we're still like battling these head-scratching climate change arguments, right? It never seems to end, does it? Seriously. But hey, that's why we're here, right? Exactly. To dive into these complex topics. Totally. Yeah. And this Rainforest Alliance piece we're looking at today is called Six Claims Made by Climate Change Skeptics and How to Respond. And it's honestly like strapping on some serious conversational armor, you know. Yeah, it's really about giving you the tools to engage thoughtfully with the science behind those arguments. So first up, the classic. It's freezing this winter. Where's your global warming now? Uh, oh, I've heard that one. Right. I swear I hear this one every year. If, like, where do we even begin with that? Well, I think right off the bat, we need to clarify the difference between weather, which is, you know, the short term stuff we experience day to day and climate, which is, you know, looking at those long term patterns over like decades or even centuries. OK, so it's like saying my goldfish lives in a bowl. Therefore, the ocean can't be real. Mm. It just doesn't compute. Exactly. It's a matter of scale. And here's a point the article makes that I think really hits home. They highlight the struggles of tropical farmers. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because they've been dealing with climate change impacts for years. Droughts, floods, unpredictable seasons. It's already a harsh reality for them. And it's easy to forget that, isn't it? Because, like, we might get a colder than usual winter here and think, see, no big deal. But meanwhile, entire communities are being upended. Exactly. And it underscores that global and unequal nature of climate change's effects. Okay, so let's move on to the second claim, which is a bit more, I don't know, subtle. Climate change is natural. It's happened before. Right. And I'll admit, I've wondered about that myself. Yeah, and it's good to question. Because it's true. Earth's climate has shifted throughout history due to natural causes, things like volcanic eruptions or variations in the Earth's orbit, you know, which impact greenhouse gas levels. But here's the crucial difference. The speed and magnitude of the change we're seeing now, which is driven by human activities, are unlike anything in the planet's history. It's happening at an unprecedented rate. So it's less about whether it's happened before and more about this like breakneck speed at which it's happening now. Exactly. And to really grasp the potential consequences the article throws in this little thought, past CO2 spikes, even the ones that occurred naturally, have triggered mass extinction events like the Permian-Triassic extinction. The, the Permian-Triassic extinction, it wiped out a staggering 96% of marine life. 96%. That's almost everything. And the recovery from that event took millions of years. So it really puts into perspective the stakes of our current situation. Yeah, talk about a sobering thought. Okay, so we've tackled two claims, and I'm already feeling more prepared for these conversations, but <laughs> let's keep going. What's next on the skeptic's greatest hits list? Well, this one pops up constantly. Scientists can't even agree on climate change. Oh, I've heard that one a lot. It's an attempt to sow doubt where there really shouldn't be any. Yeah, and frankly, it's disheartening. It's like saying gravity is just a theory, you know? Yeah. Like the evidence is right there. You hit the nail on the head. The reality is there is a near 100% scientific consensus on human-caused climate change. Think of it like this. When doctors, you know, diagnose a condition they rely on years of medical research and data. Right. Climate science works the same way. It's not just a hunch. It's based on decades of rigorous research. And to back that up, the article mentions the IPCC. That's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Right? That's right. They're kind of a big deal in the climate world. They are. Think of them as the leading experts from around the world who come together to assess the science of climate change. And their reports are incredibly thorough. They're considered the gold standard of climate science. Their latest report is basically like sounding the alarm bells right. Mm. Like it projects that we're on track to hit that critical 1.5 degrees Celsius warming threshold by 2030. A decade earlier than previously thought. Exactly. That's scary. Yeah. And exceeding this, you know, threshold has significant implications for the planet. 
increased likelihood of extreme weather events, rising sea levels, and disruptions to ecosystems, it's not good. Okay, so the science is clear, the experts agree, and the stakes are high. Got it. What's the next skeptic argument we need to be ready for? Well, claim number four uh, ventures into the natural world a little bit, suggesting that plants and animals will adapt. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it sounds reassuring on the surface, right? But let's dig a little deeper. Yeah, to be honest, that one always makes me think of like those nature documentaries where like a lizard changes color to blend in with its surroundings or something. I know, it's a common misconception. While adaptation is a natural process that has allowed species to survive and thrive over, you know, millennia, the issue we're facing now is the speed of climate change. It's happening far too quickly for many species to adapt effectively. So it's like trying to learn a new language overnight. Yeah. You might pick up a few words, but you're not going to be fluent. That's a great analogy. Thanks. Yeah. The Rainforest Alliance, they use a, a poignant example in their article. They talk about frogs. Frogs? I wouldn't have thought of them. But tell me more. So frogs are incredibly sensitive to environmental changes, especially temperature and water availability. Mm. And they're considered what they call uh, indicator species, meaning their health reflects the health of the entire ecosystem. So if frogs are struggling, it's a sign that something is seriously wrong. So if the frogs start croaking their last, it's bad news for everyone. Essentially, yes. And it's not just frogs. We're already seeing the impacts of climate change on various species from coral reefs bleaching due to warmer ocean temperatures to polar bears struggling to find food as sea ice melts. Okay, that's that's pretty bleak. But what about the argument that climate change might actually be good? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. claim number five, right? I have a hard time wrapping my head around that one. It's a tough one to swallow for sure. While some regions might experience, you know, temporary benefits like longer growing seasons in certain areas, the overall impacts of climate change are overwhelmingly negative, especially when you consider the human cost. Yeah, right. Yeah. So how does the article address this claim? So they connect climate change to uh, a deeply concerning issue, modern slavery. Whoa. Yeah, because when extreme weather events displace communities, forcing people to flee their homes and livelihoods, it creates this breeding ground for exploitation. People become incredibly vulnerable to human trafficking, forced labor, and other forms of exploitation when they're desperate for work, food, and shelter. That's heartbreaking. It's like adding insult to injury, yeah. right? People are already suffering from the effects of climate change, and then they're preyed upon in their most vulnerable moments. Exactly. And beyond the human cost, the article highlights the staggering economic impact of climate change. Okay. Yeah, it cites a potential $23 trillion loss to the global economy by 2050 if we don't take action. Okay, so even for those who might not be swayed by the moral imperative, the economic argument is pretty hard to ignore. Yeah. That's a massive hit to the global economy. Absolutely. And it underscores that this isn't just an environmental issue, right? It's intrinsically linked to our social and economic well-being. Which brings us to the final skeptic claim. It's too late to do anything anyway. And I'll admit, I have felt that wave of despair wash over me before, especially when I'm like bombarded by doom and gloom headlines, you know. It's understandable to feel that way. It really is. But it's crucial to remember that, that it's not a binary choice between success and failure. The reality is much more nuanced than that. While the article acknowledges the urgency of the situation, it emphasizes that every bit of action we take matters. It's not too late to make a difference. So there's still a chance to avert the worst case scenarios. Absolutely. The key is to, to shift from a sense of paralysis to one of agency. Hmm. We need to act decisively and collectively, recognizing that every action, no matter how small, contributes to the solution. That's a much more empowering way to frame it. So what can we do? What can our listeners do to be a part of the solution? The article mentions the importance of immediate and drastic action by governments, businesses, and individuals. It yeah. sounds like we all have a role to play. Exactly. And it's this idea of collective action that brings us to, I think, a really thought-provoking question. What if we were to treat this crisis with the same urgency and global mobilization as we have other global threats? Imagine what we could achieve. It makes you wonder, right? Like, imagine if we tackled climate change with the same focus and resources that we've poured into, say, like, developing a vaccine during a pandemic. Right. What if we viewed it as a true global emergency? That's the question we need to be asking ourselves. If we can shift our perspective from seeing this as an insurmountable problem to viewing it as a challenge we can overcome, it opens up a world of possibilities. So even amidst all this, you know, the debates and the urgency, 
there's still, there's a glimmer of hope here, yeah. right? It's not a lost cause. Exactly. We still have the power to change course, but it requires a real like fundamental shift in our thinking and our actions. That's the takeaway here. It's about recognizing that we're not just bystanders in this story. Right. We are the authors. And that's a, that's a pretty empowering thought to end on. Thanks for joining us on this climate deep dive. We hope you feel a little more quick to tackle those tough conversations and be part of the solution. Absolutely. That's it for us. We'll see you next time for another deep dive. See you then. This podcast is produced by Charles White. He created two artificial intelligent agents and he named them John Harper and Ingrid Sorensen. Additionally, Mr. White prompted and produced the AI music as well as the photographs and drawings of John and Ingrid. The purpose of the Deep Dive podcast with John and Ingrid is an experiment and exercise in knowledge management and improving lessons learned.